everybody, it's Dr. Craig Spodek, and I want to welcome you to another edition of our Bulletproof Dental Practice Podcast. I got my co-host, Dr. Peter Bolin, and uh, esteemed guest, Dr. Kyle Stanley. Um, really super excited to have you here, man. You're, uh, you're doing some amazing stuff in dentistry, and I know you're super busy, and you're flying all around because I follow you on Instagram. Uh, so I know this time is precious, and I want to get right into it. So welcome, Kyle. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. Excited yeah, man. Where are you, where, you're in San Diego right now? Well, I'm in L.A. Oh, sorry. I'm in L.A., but I was in Alaska a few days ago, and I'll be in Arizona. And, you know, I'm all over the place. Which is I know. I, I watch you, man. I watch you. I want to jump into a whole bunch of things. Obviously, I want to talk DSD, but yeah. I also want to hit on fashion as well because I, I follow your stuff. And, and, you know, last time we were there uh, in a personal meeting, we did, we did take selfies of our shoes. Um, so I know, I know design, uh, holistic design, not only Kyle, design, but fashion. we need some help, Kyle, because we both conceded when you got on the phone that we, if, if we, if you shop on your clothes on Amazon, probably not a fashionista. Yeah. But I am big and tall though. So I, I do have to search out for tall <laughs> clothing, you know? you know, that's not as bad. My, my brother's wives shop for them at Costco. So yeah, well, nice. Kyle, Kirkland is a step above, I think, now. Um, a Kirkland cashmere sweater is a step above, like, an Amazon uh, sweater. I told – I did I – did, uh, I did buy an ascot at Amazon. My buddy almost killed me. He's like, oh, that's a nice ascot. Where did you get him? Like, Amazon. He's like I, – I, it's like telling him I get my lab work done in China for, for teeth or something. It's terrible. I think that's anyway. Okay. You know what? If nobody notices – well, we can talk about that later, but – yeah, we'll, we'll have to jump onto that because I do, I do appreciate your style and um, the way you do things. And I think it's all part of um, what makes you uh, um, the badass that you are. So let's get some, let's get some background um, just for the listening audience that doesn't know who you are for the, for the people who have been living under a rock for the last five years or don't actually pay attention to what's going on. Let's talk to those people. What's your background? Where'd you go to school? Talk about your mentor, mentors and how you got brought into the DSD world of greatness. Okay, so I'm Kyle Stanley. I grew up in Orange County, California, at Disneyland. And I went to dental school at USC. While I was at dental school, I had a very important mentor, my, my dental father, uh, Pascal Manier. You know, yep. One of the leaders in aesthetic dentistry, wow. genetic dentistry, and um, near his aesthetics. I went into school thinking I was going to be an oral surgeon. Okay. And I met Pascal and he kind of changed my life and thought, well, maybe I want to do aesthetics as well. So I told Pascal I wanted to learn implants. He was like, all right, no problem. Just uh, learn Portuguese and move to Brazil. I was like, what? And he's like, uh, yeah, well, you know, Brazil is leading right now in implant dentistry. All the research is coming out of there. And Dr. Brandemark is even teaching down there six months out of the year. So if you want to learn from the best, you have to learn from the Brazilians. So I learned Portuguese. I moved to Florianopolis, Brazil. I did my implant residency, my implant specialty. And then I came back. I was teaching at USC with Pascal. And he introduced me to my second mentor, who is Sasha Jovanovic. And Sasha is, you know, one of the most famous periodontists in the world, leader in bone regeneration. So I've been lucky to work under Sasha for the last eight years. And then I started lecturing and speaking around the world. And I was always from afar watching Christian Coachman. And he just mesmerized me. I was reading his articles and watching videos. And then I got the opportunity to speak alongside him in Indonesia. And he saw some of the stuff I was doing. And we had a conversation. And he invited me on to the DSD team and I became a KOL for DSD. And now Christian has really changed my life in the last few years, just helping me with exposure and we're working on a bunch of different things. So that's me in a nutshell. I'm a private practitioner. I'm a researcher. I teach at a university and I'm a lecturer. Those are kind of my, my four hats. Yeah. Speaking of hats, by the way, you do have some pretty badass hats. I can't let that go. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I would love to wear those, but I would, you know how tall I am. We, you know, six foot five. If I wore that, I'd be, I'm already freakishly tall. 
right. putting on that is a whole other level of, yeah. of tallness that I don't, I'm not ready for yet. That's a few inches. It makes yeah, it does. Smart, yeah. yeah, so um, yeah, Christian, all the people you mentioned, I mean, just amazing, amazing leaders in dentistry. And um, I, I clearly see you uh, as that guy as well. Um, how long have you been in dentistry? When did you graduate USC? Graduated 2010, so I've been practicing eight years. Yeah, so I mean, you're on a trajectory of that same magnitude, if not more. So uh, I, I feel, you know, just really honored to call you my friend. And, and I love that you give back so much. You know, we're, we're friends uh, and, and we talk about this stuff and, and you just give it all. And that's, that's what Pete and I do. And that's why um, we really appreciate you being here. It's all about just giving back and elevating the profession. A rising tide floats all ships. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. And especially with the young speaker crowd, what I found is that everybody is super helpful to each other. I know. Mm -hmm. We help recommend each other for, um, you know, like if I, if I get invited somewhere, I'll say, hey, do you need any more speakers? I know the best guys that, you know, maybe not everybody knows because they're from a smaller country or they're whatever. And so we can help each other out and vice versa. People do the same for me. And on, you know, that, that WhatsApp group that we're on, the World Traveler Dentist, everyone's really open about things and helpful. Yeah. I can't believe how transparent people are. Yeah. And I so think giving. Christian, I think Christian has something to do with that because he, he does. He was the first person, the first speaker that I knew that was like, here, let me give you my slides. And I was like, what? like, that's crazy. And, you know, he explained to me that most people are genuine and will not take credit for your stuff. There will be people that will, mm -hmm. If you have your name out there, everybody knows, oh, this is Christian stuff. No one's going to say this random person made this up because Christian gave them his slides. So I think that that started this sharing. And I love that about our profession right now, currently, because I don't think it was always like that. I, I agree with you. I think for a long time, there was a lot of people that really didn't have street cred. They were on the lecture circuit that were preaching that they could do it, but they didn't really have the chops to really pull it off in their own private practice. Right. So there was a scarcity mentality. And like, I better not let anybody find out all these people that you've just mentioned are so legit. And it's like the way education's breaking down, like, look, this stuff is free now. Yeah. You know, like we give so much to, to get people to be intrigued and then want more. And if you want more, maybe there's a paying opportunity. You can pay for more, exactly. but we give 70% of it away. Cool stuff. Yeah, Christian is an awesome, awesome human being. So giving, so kind. Um, and, and the guys on the WTD group, uh, for those that are listening that don't know what that is, Christian, I guess it was his group, right? World Traveler Dentist. It was a WhatsApp uh, group that um, I was lucky enough to be invited to. And it's just the world's top dentists um, that are all just kind of learning from each other. But the amount of information, the different time zones, if you go to sleep and you've cleared it's out overwhelming. Your you wake up and there's a million messages like, what yeah, the hell I'm so happened? Lost. I'm so lost. And then it goes off into different tangents, uh, shoes and, and accessories and fashion as well. There is a, there is a recurring theme in this group of, of design for smile, design for office, and design for the way you look, which is, uh, I think, a recurring theme at school. Everybody's artistic, which is great. Exactly. So, Kyle, I actually uh, partook in the DSD residency in New York a couple – a couple of years ago, maybe it's been now, and where you were actually, oh. you were actually speaking. Um, um, and I, you know, I actually had to leave the, the conference a little early. I had to leave one day early just because I had to get back from a family emergency. Yeah. But my point of that is that some of the work that I was actually most blown away by your stuff and your slides when you were showing, and especially like I've been mesmerized by, and I want you to talk about this a little bit, is the, and I don't know the name for it, where uh, you basically do that procedure where you raise the, the lip. Uh, yeah. The long lip. Um, oh, cool, what, yeah. what is the what is the name of that? What are you what are you calling that? Yeah. So the the concept is called the lip factor, and it's okay. the the idea of knowing that either us as dentists or our, our colleagues <laughs> as oral surgeons or plastic surgeons can move the lip if we need to. Mm -hmm. We we've, we've kind of been told and been taught that we just accept where the lip is and plan our whole rehabilitation around that. You know, usually we're told to start a full rehabilitation, whether it's implants, veneers, whatever. You take wherever the lip is, you add two millimeters to it, and that's where your incisal edge should be. But we were never taught that maybe the lip is in the incorrect position. 
or maybe the lip is in the non-aesthetic position or maybe it's mm -hmm. in a senile position that a longer aging thin lip so we don't want to plan a whole rehabilitation around that so i found this plastic plastic surgery procedure that was being underutilized and i worked with dr ben Tele, who's one of the most amazing plastic surgeons here in beverly hills and we've been able to modify the technique and make it reproducible and be used every day and it brings this whole idea of interdisciplinary treatment and i know that people talk about that oftentimes but usually they mean with different dental professionals but now like what we're doing with christian is doing the oral facial club where we're, we have plastic surgeons on our team we have dermatologists on our team we have uh, pathologists it's become outside of dentistry and just taking care of someone's face or someone's head and thinking not just about teeth and gums because we so much like you know think about mm -hmm. like in a microscope and we you know we wear loops we need to step back and yeah. appreciate the full face of the patient and know what can be done whether we do it or not so whether it's plastic surgeons helping us that's just the whole idea of the lip factor is involving the lip and knowing that you have some input on it and if it's not in the correct position we can change it yeah i think yeah, was, i'm gonna post a link because i think it's got it's kind of one of those things you have to see and it's hard to explain but you know it was crazy watching the incisions go right under you know the the, the border of the nose and be yeah. basically just elevated and, and it literally was like watching rewinding the clock on these you know, I saw it was women. So rewinding the clock from these women 20 years, as opposed to what typically they have done is had a lot of injections and you get that duck lip kind of scenario. Like this was actually just rejuvenate. It was, it was, it was crazy. My wife is, my wife's totally into that kind of stuff. And she was like, what is yeah. blown away by, by that procedure. So anyway, man, kudos to you for really kind of trailblazing that. And uh, like I said, do you, if you have, you have a YouTube video on that, right? Or was, I saw it on your social, but do you have a link that I'll be able to post? I'm actually going to be posting my 18 minute lecture from the Seattle study club meeting about that. Okay. So I'll be posting that in the next week or two. And okay. that really like explains the concept, shows some of the surgeries, and can get people excited about, about what to do. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think in, I think in general there's another wave like you know when when I got out of school I'm I'm quite a bit older than than you Kyle but when I got out of school in 1998 no one knew what a porcelain veneer was they didn't realize what was possible as far as changing the shape of the teeth um, and I had to explain what it was now with with all the reality shows that happened and the you know early 2000s mid 2000s people readily understand that you can take a smile that looks you know, an aesthetic smile and make it a pretty smile. But I think by and large, the public can, does not understand the facial ramifications of rebuilding the vertical dimension and things like, you know, lip support governed by teeth. So we have a lot of patients that are running up to plastic surgeons getting more and more stuff because they're collapsing their VDO. And you, and, and I just started seeing more and more people that are just totally shocked. It's not about your, your teeth could be beautiful. You could have had, you know, 10 veneers done, you know, 20 years ago and your veneers have worn your lower down so much. Your teeth are actually very pretty when you smile and you lift your lip up, but your facial support is all lost. I think the public doesn't understand that yet. So I think it'd be really cool to, if there was some way to show them, it's not about the teeth, it's just the face and just not even smile. Oh, and the rule of thirds, right? How that, how that, you know, isn't, isn't spoken about as enough. And we talk it's about, not. you know, complex care and dentistry and how that supports the lower third of your face. And Kyle, I'm not, you know, you're the expert in this field. It's definitely not, um, you know, can you, can you, can you kind of comment on that a little bit more? Yeah, well, you're, you're exactly right with the lower third of the face and just as much as, cause we can blame dentists and say like, we don't incorporate plastic surgery into our treatment. But just as much as we don't, plastic surgeons don't either. So we don't know anything about, about plastic surgery. Plastic surgeons don't know anything about dentistry. And really, if we were working together, we could like have this crazy trajectory. And I know. And with, with, with my office and Dr. Tele is that he gets a patient, let's say they come in and they need a lip lift. And he says, okay, but I just want you to consult with Kyle first because we may need to change your teeth a little bit before I do this yep. and vice versa. We'll get patients that'll come into us and say, 
I want to show more teeth. I want to, I see those people that when they talk, they show their teeth and that's so pretty. I used to look like that. My daughter looks like that. My son looks like that. And so I want to make my teeth longer. And we're like, whoa, 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 hold on. Your teeth may need some work, but let's put the lip in the correct position first and then let's reevaluate that. And they're like, what do you mean? So it also becomes a business strategy as well because you know, we're getting referrals from Dr. Talley. Dr. Talley is getting referrals from us. And our patients are benefiting so much. Oh, yeah. The, the, you, you, the, work, yeah you're, the work that you're doing plus the work that, his doing, that he's doing yeah. is unbelievable transformation. Him right. alone or you alone is not going to really – it's, it's, right. it's, un, it's unbelievable. Because you can do as much stretching and augmentation. Right. If you have a collapsed lower third, patient looks old. No matter how taut your skin is, you're exactly still looking old. Right. And it becomes a synergistic, synergistic yeah. thing where our patients benefit. Oftentimes they get less, a more minimally invasive treat, dental treatment because mm-hmm. if yeah. you put the lip in the correct position, although it's a surgical procedure, it's, you know, it takes 45 minutes and it's, it's usually done under local. You put the lip in the correct position. Then later, maybe we just do Invisalign or maybe we just do Invisalign and like two little incisals to make that, that pop a little bit instead of doing 10 veneers. Yeah. Right. And the patients, when you explain that can appreciate it. The hard part is dentists understanding it, plastic surgeons understanding it, and then relaying that to the patients and having them understand it. But once they do, it's crazy. We get patients traveling from all over the world to do this because there's no, not very many teams that are doing this. And you're talking about conservative, which I think is, is, it's still a huge concern in dentistry from what I see, meaning uh, I see a lot of abusive cases. I'm actually about to redo one here in, in 30 minutes where I was able to see the case before because she's been a long time patient, had it, some, had it done somewhere else because she moved. And so I was able to see her, her virgin teeth, if you will, and then the preps and, and, and see this pervasive problem in dentistry. Another thing I want to comment on too is, you know, we talk about the lower third and sometimes, you know, you talk about like elevating the vertical and it seems like these full mouth cases. And, and, and what I want to tell people sometimes when, when a patient's sitting in the chair, it's actually the better dentistry because we're not having to kind of, we're actually creating that space out of porcelain by doing an additive addition as opposed to prepping you and creating that space in, in a crown situation because you're so overclosed, right? You're actually doing an additive thing. And so it, it sounds major like, wow, you know, like, it sounds like major dentistry, but every time I do it, I'm like, this was such better treatment than if I hadn't addressed the vertical and tried to look at the facial aesthetic and that vertical from a Shambashi kind of number, right? I mean, you know, um, is that still thrown around, Kyle Shambashi? That was back in the days when I was, it is okay. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's, that was, that's my comment on the, uh, on, on what you were just kind of saying, my, my two cents. And it's just, it's, it's great to see you as an ambassador for, the, the, the conservative treatment and, and less is more kind of thing um, because I don't see that enough being talked about. I mean, you conservative dentistry is, is talked about, but I don't see it actually applied as much as I would like to see it in, in the, in said the key word and the key word is it's not being taught. And I think so much of the problems in dentistry is coming from people do what they learn in dental school and many mm-hmm. dental schools are behind. I mean, uh, know, I, yeah. I travel all over the world and it's not just the United States, it's all over the world, but I'll ask people, I'll I'll give a presentation and I'll show some inlays or onlays and they're like, we weren't taught that. Hey Kyle, sorry. Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Can you come close to the microphone? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Perfect. Yeah. Go go ahead. And um, what I found is that people are still taught like every tooth needs a crown on it, which is Mm -hmm. crazy. Like a patient doesn't leave with a crown unless they came in with a crown. Everything else is partial coverage. And everyone is like, well, how do you do that? And it's just, you just need to learn how to bond. And yeah. we, we were lucky that we were taught by Pascal Magne, who's like the, the bondodontist, the king of bonding. But people still think we're crazy. Like, well, you, you don't put a crown on it? What about, right. well, yeah, we cover the cusp, but we don't have to go all the way down to the gingiva. What's the, what's the point of this? Yeah, there's no point. The, the materials are so pretty now. I've done, I've ended margins on mid facials of number five and it looks great exactly you know and it's more it's more cleansable interface like yeah everything we're saying is it's it's better treatment Mm -hmm. it's better treatment but to your point kyle like it used to be you were taught it's either a a filling or a crown yes well look at at our but look at our board like our board will make you do like you'll have to pass the board exam 
you're going to have to do drill down a fully cusped tooth, a large tooth, two plane reduction, bring it all in. So it has 1.5 millimeters of reduction uniform. That's what we're, that's the standard you, to get your damn license. Yep. It's crazy. I think so much of what's being taught in the dental schools, even like high level dental schools that have big names that patients know, like who you went to this school, it's still like 30 year old dentistry. It's what my dad yeah. taught in 1977. And a, and a whole different level when you get to specialty, by the way. Yes. A whole different level. So as an oral surgeon, you're going to spend four years doing this massive scope, literally slaying dragons, putting heads back together in a trauma ward. And somehow you've been decreed to be the, the highest level of standard to put a dental implant in. No understanding of restorative principles. It's very scary. It's, it's, a, it's a major breakdown in, in the way, you know, it, it's, it's wild. It's like, it's, it would be like training airline pilots to fly prop planes. Airline pilots nowadays are computer. They, they have to know their computers. they how to enter the data. And that's what dentists are. If you don't know how to work the, 3D program or the CAD and whether it's ClinCheck or a guided surgery and you're just going through a traditional program taught with a 60 or 70 year old instructor, you're really out, you're coming out of school obsolete. Yeah, you took the words out of my mouth with the oral surgery programs. One of my really good friends um, was in an oral surgery program and I always say that many oral surgeons are overtrained and that there should be two roads of oral surgery programs. There should be a hospital based one and there should be a private practice one. Right. Because so many oral surgeons are doing jaw surgery, fractures, trauma, uh, cancer, all this stuff. And they get out of school and they do wisdom teeth and implants. Right. But like you said, they'll spend four years and they'll graduate doing 50 implants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If that. Oh, God, if that. Like, what? And, and by the way, the hospital world is like, you know, there's this whole attitude. And I'm not trying to pick on oral surgery. I, I would love to see the profession shift. But, you know, when you're talking about put, doing a radical head and neck dissection <clears throat> or repairing someone as Lafour from a, a car accident, that's a gross, larger scale, you know, just patch them up. Yeah, your nose is going to be a little off. And then you get down to the granular level, the myopic level, mac, the micro level of an implant. And two degrees is success and failure. And you tell an officer, your implant's five degrees off. Bro, are you freaking kidding me? Like, that guy, that guy went through a windshield. Yeah, you know, it's just happy that we got his nose on his face. But again, that's mm -hmm. not what we're talking. You know, you can't have that mentality for this model I'm sending you for tooth number nine. Yeah. So there's this very interesting bravado that they leave with, and they all leave. And I've seen this pattern because I've worked with so many. They leave saying, "I've got to find a trauma ward to work in because I got to use my scope. I've, I've learned all this stuff." They're they're so smart. They do so many amazing things in residency. But I think that sometimes these residencies, and I know because some of my really good friends are oral surgeons, they teach bone-based implantology and not tissue-based implantology. Yeah. yeah. So they know how to do every bone graft in the world, but they don't do one tissue graft, which you guys and I both know bone sets its own, but tissue is the issue. So no matter how great the bone is, if you don't have the tissue, the implants will fail. I love, I love talking to an oral surgeon about keratinized tissue, like how they look at you like, you know, there's really, there's really no attached tissue around this. It's like, are you like, it's like talking to a farmer about the new product collection or I don't know, you know, it's like, it's not even their wheelhouse. And I don't want to say, I don't want to bash oral surgery because there are many successful ones who have pivoted. You know, there's one locally here that's pivoted and really buried into, um, you know, the restorative aspects, but that's the aberration. That's yeah. a real... Uh, you know, our friend Richard Martin, who's in Texas, he is like the ultimate idea of oral surgeons that understand restorative dentistry. I mean, he took the DSC residency, he reads restorative treatment books, and, you know, he, he has Pascal Magnin's book, I mean, which is crazy for like an oral surgeon to have like mi minimally invasive inlays, veneers, to have a book like that. So when you get someone that understands the surgical and the restorative side, they don't have to even do both. But if they understand both, the patient benefits so much. But just to get to Mark for a second, is his scope that broad? Is he doing um, orthognathic surgery and all that? Yeah, so um, Richard Martin does, does orthognathic surgery. He does trauma. He 
has a private practice. So he's just a total badass. I mean, he's yes. that, that, those people, th there are people that can do that. They speak six languages, they fly planes, they race cars. Right. But I mean, most are not that. They, they, it's just your scope is, I once worked with a oral surgeon. He was board certified plastic and oral surgeon. So he would do blepharoplasties, breast augmentations, dental implants. I mean, the scope was nuts. Yeah. And my, my other friend is, um, my other friend's a board certified ENT, but facial plastic surgeon, but he stays to that zone where the interface happens. Yeah. So he only does he only does rhino revision rhinoplasties and yeah. faces. That's like Dr. Tele too. He's a he's an ENT and facial. Yeah, they know each other. This oh, is really? um yeah because yeah, I met like yeah we talked about that. It's Dr. Yeah. Jacob Steiger. Yeah. And they yeah. both they built they both spoke very highly of each other. Yeah, that's really. But cool. but they but look they've taken this broad spectrum of knowledge and then kind of funneled it down to the zone that where the interface happens. Yeah. And for the for us normal people. That are that that um that, that that don't have brains the size of Pascal Magnier or, or Dr. Martin. It's nice to find your scope. Yeah. Kyle, I want to I want to circle back up um to the conservative aspect because I because I feel like um you encounter it a lot in your day to day practice and being an ambassador for that. I wonder if do you hear what I kind of hear on mine is like, hey doc, you're not really gonna have to prep that much because you're telling me you're going to be so conservative or no prep or minimal prep, is the cost going to be as much? Like, why isn't it cheaper? And I actually tell patients, and this is going back to your dental school <laughs> comment about being taught wrong, but I actually tell them, I'm saying, look, to do it conservative is actually a way harder. Like the easiest okay. thing in dentistry for me would be to just crown prep you and send it in my lab and let them figure it out. Yes. Yeah. You, you know, and, um, and it's just funny how people, you know, I don't know. I don't know what, what my question is to that other than just, you know, it's, it's a little bit frustrating because I feel like we're beginning my practice. We kind of begin with the end in mind and I'm reverse engineering your case as opposed to just like, let me just whittle you down to, you know, as one of my patients said, cat teeth. And um, I couldn't believe he actually used that term. He's like, yeah, my old dentist gave me like cat teeth. And I, you know, and I said, Jesus, it's just, it's just a problem. And so I want to circle back up because you guys were talking at a super high level that I wasn't relating to with yeah. surgeons and such. And I want to bring it back to kind of a, uh, you know, stuff that, that we uh, as generalists can, can really kind of institute in our day-to-day, -day. just some design principles maybe that you can kind of yeah. um, help I, us. I haven't had a patient ask if it's cheaper, if it is less conservative, because I, I feel like a lot of the patients that come to our practice are these patients that like read blogs, they do a lot of research before they come to us, and they know that we are the people that are mm -hmm. the anti-crown people. Got it. They usually come to us after having a few different consultations with other doctors that tell them they need crowns or tell them they need whatever, extraction, whatever it is. And so they understand that there may be a premium to a different type of training. And most of our patients understand that. You know, my, my practice is not cheap. We're, we're probably one of the most expensive in our building. There's 50 something dentists in my building. That's crazy. What? Yeah. yeah. He told me this before. Yeah. We're one of the most expensive, but we still do oh my God. a lot of treatment because patients appreciate this. And I think that I was listening to one of your guys' podcasts a few days ago talking about DSOs and a lot of dentists are afraid of the DSOs. And I think the DSO mania right now helps practices like mine because it differentiates <laughs> so much because like my practice, yeah. my practice we don't take insurance we see one patient at a time and we, we have two restorative chairs and three doctors we have a thousand square feet we take a lot of time you know we have hour-long consults so it differentiates us from this dso uh, yeah practice so much that I think it's only helped us because we have people that will go DSOs or go to, you know, these kind of like chop shop places and they see like, Oh, this is like very sales oriented. This is very, you know, like let's use up all your insurance or you need something or not. And um, then they come to our practice and it differentiates us just by having it be like a smaller um, show, you know, Mm -hmm. yeah. That, yeah i agree with that i think that there is a good place for that because it's it's going to amplify what you're doing to a certain degree um yeah. 
Hey guys, I need to I need to bounce out. I've got a little office emergency, but y'all keep talking because this is awesome. Scott, Pete, too. buddy, yeah, thanks. Later, Pete. Um, let me. He's still wearing his headset, though. Hopefully, he doesn't run to the bathroom now. <laughs> right. I've been at a lecture before where that happened. Yeah, me too. Me too. Me too. I was uh, lecturing at um, the. Uh, Excellence in dentistry. And I had a terrible cough, so I had a you know one of the headset mics. I kept having to kill it and hack my brains out. Anyway, I, I love where we we're going um, uh, with that. And, and to answer Peter's question, because uh, Peter's like, how do I? How do you deal with that? I've actually had people say that. Oh, it's less work. You know, it's the same thing of like you know if you use a robotic surgical procedure versus you know the old way. I'm like they used to when they did a knee replacement. They used to fillet you. Right. And, you know, in the hospital, you can't, you know, I tell people that take patients this all the time in dentistry, you can actually practice really outdated dentistry. Yeah. You can, there's no, like in the hospital, if you say, you know, yeah, I heard about the laparoscopic thing you guys have been doing for the last 10 or 15 years or the Da Vinci or that robot or this. I don't really like that. I like to cut people from mid tibia to like mid thigh. <laughs> what is that noise? Is that Peter? Oh, it maybe my dog snoring. Really? Wow. I don't know. Maybe. I, I have a few. I have a few. Yeah. So it's just like in the hospital, they don't let you do that anymore. But there's a lot of these rogue dentists that practice their own little environments, and there's all these um, these things that they're doing still, which is incredible. Yeah, it's. I see this all the time because after I'm speaking, I'll have people come up to me and say, "Hey, you know, I was." I, they'll bring models or something. And say, "I was thinking about doing this case, and this is what I was thinking about doing," and Sometimes it's awesome and sometimes it's just like, you know, what my dad was taught in the 70s. Yeah. Is your dad a dentist? My dad is a dentist and my brother's a dentist too. Oh, I had no idea, man. You're second generation? I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm third. I know Christian's like fourth, right? Or Sixth. Oh my God. It's a genetic mutation being yeah, passed down. Guinness Book of World Records, the longest dental family. So where does, oh really? That's awesome. Um, where is, um, where's your dad practice? My dad practices in the Inland Empire, which is like 50 miles east of Los Angeles. Okay. My brother is in Queen Creek, Arizona, which is just outside of Phoenix. Oh, that's awesome. And what type of dentistry is your dad doing? My dad does like very general dentistry. And my brother has really gotten into implants and I've, um, I've been able to train him and teach him on, on some cases. So just yet yesterday he sent me, he did full upper, lower, all in four, surgical and restorative, so. Wow, that's so cool. Just out of curiosity, um, what are the all in four fees in your region? I'm just curious, I think it would be beneficial. Because I, I, know, I know Clear Choice is kind of putting downward pressure in certain, in certain markets, but what, yeah. where, what are you guys finding? We <coughs> from 20 to 60. Per arch. Per arch, yeah. I would say the average in Beverly Hills is probably about 35. And are you guys using a lot of acrylic as final conversions or are you guys doing monolithic zirconia? Yeah, we're mostly doing monolithic zirconia or monolithic zirconia with facial cutback. Yeah, and you're doing upper and lower zirconia? Yes and no. Sometimes yeah. we are and sometimes we're doing upper zirconia with... Um, Lower acrylic, so lower hybrid. Yeah. So the upper in zirconia, and this is something I learned from Saj Jivraj, is that if there is uh, an aesthetic emergency, you know, if a tooth pops off, we don't yeah. want to do number eight. Yeah, number 24, not a big deal. Yeah. But zirconia and zirconia can be a, a pretty um, a noisy uh, condition. It can. I think that the, the way that people get in trouble with this, with dentists get in trouble with this, is they don't talk to the patient about it. And yeah. so having this open conversation saying, you know, we've got a really good material. It's not going to stain. It's more than likely not going to break, but it can click. And are you okay with that? Yeah. And say, yeah, sure. Shoot. If I don't, if it's not going to stain, then great. Yeah. Or you might say, well, I don't know. I don't really want to have that clicking sound. So I think just yeah. being open with your patients, that's, that's become so much of what I lecture about, you know, like yeah. I'll, I'll do a lecture all day. This is when I was in Alaska last week. 
all, the, the whole lecture was about implants, restorative, guided surgery, all this. But I go on so many tangents about being honest with your patients, yeah, with your patients, because I've learned this the hard way in that if you don't say it's going to be six months or I can guarantee you 10 teeth or I need to see you every three months after we do this, then patients will be mad at you and they'll say, well, you never told me this. What I know. Telling someone something after is an, uh, an excuse, before is an explanation. And that is psychologically, I know it's such a subtle point, but I want the people to, that are listening to this to really understand the, psycho, the psychological perspective of that. You can never overcome it. Telling people this, this tooth looks like it's going to need a root canal. Yes. And it's very likely and it doesn't. No one will ever be mad at you for that. Whereas the one person that you say, this is no big deal. There's a, and we tend to oversimplify things because we're selling. And the best selling is educating. Like right. you said, like, hey, would you rather have something that's aesthetically more desirable, not going to kind of pick up the smell and stain of the acrylic because the acrylic's kind of like a sponge and it's, it's more likely to break. The downside is going to click more. Yeah. Oh, I, I, you know, I'm a newscast. I can't, I don't care about clicking. Right. Clicking when? Only clicking when you eat. You're not going to be walking. You don't touch your teeth when you talk unless yeah. someone really screwed you up. Yeah. You know, and you don't eat like this either. You know? But it's, it's all about the education. And I wish the profession, I wish we'd understand that. I wish someone would. It's, it's so much easier. It's such a less stressful position because if you give your patient a proper education, you never get in trouble. They come to you and say, oh, my God, Doc, I'm so sorry. I chose the wrong thing. How much is it going to cost to fix it? That's why I love Invisalign, by the way. Invisalign, you know, and I, I, I do, that's all I do in my own practice. Yeah. You know, when you do yeah, restorative results. Providers in the nation. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's just say the world right now, because that feels really good. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but um, I, when I tell patients about, like, when you do a restorative result and they, they ha something goes awry, they get recurrent decay or something like that invariably there is this conversation of like, well, it should have lasted longer with Invisalign. I tell people, if you don't retain your teeth, you'll see me in five or seven years. They'll look like exactly the same way. Yes. So, and there will be a charge to redo your case yeah. and they come in and, and when they're not doing what they're supposed to do, when a, when a person with a restorative treatment has been delivered, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. They're not showing up for cons, uh, cleanings. They're not flossing. They're eating gummy bears for breakfast. There's no accountability. Somehow it's your fault that that failed. Yeah. But with the Invisalign, have you been wearing your retainers on a nightly basis? Yeah. I've been good. Well, are you wearing them every night? Well, I'm good. Well, does that mean every night? No, it's like once a month. I'm like, well, your teeth moved. Yeah. Okay, doc, how much do I have to pay now? Right. It's a very, it's a different, and, and the same thing goes to your point of educating patients and that when you give them those choices and you told them they wanted zirconia and now it's clicking, they come back to you and say, I'm sorry, I made a wrong decision. Yeah, but ha you're exactly right. You have to have a conversation before things happen and give the patient. I like to under-promise and over-deliver. Yeah, and people will actually buy more. So people think in the consultation, it's really about a, it's a, it's about a sale. I love to tell my docs, I tell patients this all the time. If I can provide you with a proper education or the this consultation, if I can give you all the information and you're educated, you'll make the best decision based for you. You're exactly right. That's like when patients say, like, what would you do? That's easy. Yeah. And I like to inform them because I never want to make the decision for the patient. Exactly. Because, you know, heaven forbid something happens and they come back yeah. and say, you made me do this. Yeah. So I like to give them all the information and then let them make the decision because, you know, our lives aren't the same. Sometimes this may fit into their life better, even though I think yeah. something else is better. And so once, when they make the decision, then the patients can really take ownership of this. And if something happens, whether it's based on biology or whatever, then they can own it instead of having it come back onto, the, onto us. And those qualifiers that you just mentioned are so important. When, when a patient asks you what, you, what would you do? My generic answer is I'm a dentist and I'm really into teeth and I don't mind going through this type of thing. You know, I don't mind going through this treatment. And I also tell patients, like, your mouth is in a massive amount of neglect. If they, if they show up and they're, they're decay everywhere, and, you know, I say, listen, we can fix your teeth. The teeth that we're going to put in your mouth won't be as good as the ones that God gave you. You right. know, God makes the best teeth. 
and look at where you are, you're 45 and the teeth are shot. So if you don't have a behavior modification with it, you're going to be really mad at me in seven years. Yes. So I can't, and, and I think this is an important thing to jump off on. In medicine, when you show up to the medical doctor and God forbid you have cancer, the doctor doesn't tell you like, I am going to cure your cancer. They say, Mr. Jones, I'm really sorry you have cancer. We have some good treatments. You know, I'm going to work with you on this. But in dentistry, somehow people show up and like, I have TMJ. I will fix that for you. Yeah. So it becomes like dentist and disease versus patient. Yeah. Versus patient, disease, and, de and, and doctor. And it's a very subtle thing, but we make very broad. People say to me all the time, can you cure my TMJ? If you move my teeth, will my TMJ get better? The t I mean, there's no body of evidence. I'm, re I'm really happy we're talking about this because you're going to be the one that knows the answer to this. But to my knowledge, there's no body of evidence that has a, um, a causative relationship, not a correlative, but a causative relationship between malocclusion and pain. I know they're correlated. I don't think so. Yeah, I think, I think you're correct in saying that. But I would imagine that there's a good amount of our colleagues out there that say, you have a bad bite. Like, let's just say there's no crowding. The patient only just touches in two points of contact. Wide open bite. You have a bad bite. You're going to have a problem. Let's do some orthognathics, blah, 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 blah on you. I mean, when you tell a patient, like, you have a bad bite, they somatize that. Like, you know what? Yeah. I ask patients. I, I'm careful when I ask a patient. I'm like, do you have any trouble eating? You look ner Are you having, do you have pain? Do you have any trouble eating? Well, why? And I'm very careful. I'm like, I'm just curious. Yeah. Well, why? I'm like, do you have any complaints? Do you have any complaints about your smile? Are you able to eat, chew, function? Yeah, I, I look nourished, don't I? And they go, why? I'm like, well, I just, I'm not saying there's a problem, but you only touch on one point in your entire mouth. Yep. And you're 50. And there's no wear. We had a patient the other day who was actually a lab technician that we're treating. And he wanted us to give him an anterior open bite. He wanted us to raise his vertical dimension in the back. Yeah. He's a denture back. tech, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> like, well, I had an open bite before as a kid, so I'm okay with that. And we were like, yeah, but like, you know, our restorations probably won't last if we don't have anterior. Some patients are fine with this stuff. I mean, you see yeah. these patients where they have an anterior open bite for 20 years and they're fine. No pain. Yeah. No wear. Yeah, no, no wear. wear, of course. You have, you have perfect occlusion and people are destroying their teeth in tons of pain. Yeah. And they have people that have wide open, you know, 20 millimeter open bite, tongue thruster, nowhere, no perio, happy. And then, I, and then dentists come in and say, I'm going to fix that for you. And I think this becomes a problem because it puts a lot of pressure on us. Holy shit. And something that I've been really passionate about recently that I've been talking about is stress and dentistry because we have a lot of our colleagues that are committing suicide and it's something that people still are though, Kyle? still still yeah we're still it, we're 500 times more likely to commit suicide than than uh the general public i would imagine that's a, that's terrible I'm, I'm really happy we're talking about this i would imagine that statistic is much higher in group practices where there's <laughs> yes probably <laughs> i'm kidding i'm kidding i'm kidding but it's this it's this thing where like you know, and every dentist has gone through it to where it's like, we're juggling so many different things. And I, when I was in dental school, people were always joking to me about that. Like, oh yeah, well, dentists have the highest suicide rate. And I'd be like, what do you mean? They're probably like, what are they gonna kill themselves on their boat? Like in a, you know, yeah. on their day off on Wednesday, playing golf or something. And then I started practicing and I started getting into this and realizing that it is a stressful profession. Yeah. And so recently, whenever I'm lecturing, I try to incorporate this stress lecture and I'll give, you know, I'll talk for eight hours about implants, smile design, digital dentistry, all this stuff. And what the people come up and talk to me about afterwards is the 45 minutes of stress that I talked about. And they're like, thanks so much for talking about that. You know, I'm going through this. There's all these statistics where dentists are twice as likely to be depressed twice as likely to have anxiety disorder, twice as likely to have panic disorder. And the U.S. News and World Report still says we have the number two best job in the world. Right behind a hygienist, no less. <laughs> yeah. Well, number one last, or this last time they did it was a software developer. 
Oh, cool. Number one software developer. Number two is dentist. But we're also the number two most likely profession. <laughs> there's my son. To kill, to kill ourselves. God, man, that's terrible. It's something that nobody's talking about. And when I'll, I'll lecture, I was in Alaska, and I said, anybody here know a colleague who has committed suicide? 75% of the, of the people raise their hand. Wow. Oh, you know? my God. I had, Kyle, I had no idea, man. That's yeah. really upsetting. Are there colleagues who have committed suicide? No, no, thank God. No. My brother does, my dad does. So I started looking into this and looking like, why is this? Well, why is this happening? So debt is a big one. So the average dental student gets out of school with about $271,000 in debt. Over 80% of dental students have over $100,000 in debt. I mean, I personally got out of dental school with over $400,000 in debt. Yeah. Just from dental school. I mean, my parents paid for my undergrad. That's just dental school. And then you buy a practice, you buy a house, you get married, you need a car, all this stuff. You know, people are one, two million dollars in debt by the time they're 30 years old. So there's a lot of pressure with that. We have the um, seclusion. You know, you and I don't have that because we have partners and this kind of stuff, which I love. But most dentists, welcome back, Pete. Most dentists are by themselves all day which doesn't help. And then we have um, litigation, which is huge. There's a statistic that says 73% of dentists are actively fearful of being sued, which is stressful. That is stressful. Um, which is, you know, one of the reasons why I lecture. It gives me two days where I can't be sued. Oh, God. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, I say it as a joke, but it's true. Yeah. Well, oh, don't worry. Eventually, someone will say, Kyle told me. Yeah, you'll get sued for lecturing, Kyle. Yeah. <laughs> Kyle told me partial coverage is better, and I did it. Look what happened. And then it popped off, right? Yeah. But and, is, there, is there another portion to this theory? I want to keep hearing all of your thoughts, because I have one as well. Yeah, so there's litigation, there's seclusion, um, revisions, which you guys are probably like, what's well, a revision, right? Because this is something that happens in medicine. It doesn't happen in dentistry. So let's say I'm an idiot. I, I jump off of a house. I'm playing with my friends in high school. I jump off the house and I break my ankle in 30 pieces. Foot and ankle surgeon does a surgery, but I still limp. I don't sue the surgeon. But in dentistry, either the patient would come back and say, oh, well, you did something wrong. So either you have to pay for it you give me my money back or you do the second surgery for free. And this is something that's specific to dentistry. It doesn't happen in the other medical professions is the idea of revisions. And I think a lot of it comes to what Craig, you and I were just talking about is dentists over promising. You yeah. know, hey, this is going to be great. This is going to fix all your problems. And then the patient, it doesn't fix all their problems. Or even if the, the patient does everything right, the dentist does everything right and biology happens. Right, right. It's all the time in implant dentistry, you know. I do full procedure, <laughs> guided surgery, everything perfect. The patient is not a smoker, doesn't chew on something. He or she does everything right and the implant can still fail. Oh, yeah. So I think what it is is like the public understands dentistry as a like almost like carpentry. Like you made me a table. Yes. Right, you made me a table. The table was great. And then four years later, a leg fell off the table and the table fell down. You yeah. need that leg should have been attached. So, and I tell patients all the time, I'm very careful about this because I, I, I hope I'm making the point clear enough, but that dentist disease versus patient is the problem. So medicine is patient and disease. Mrs. Jones, you have cancer. I am going to try my best to beat your cancer. I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. I've seen people that do well. I've seen people that don't. And then it's like, okay, doc, help me through this. We'll walk together. I'll be your partner. Yeah. And in dentistry, it's like you come in, you haven't been to the dentist in 20 years. You don't even own a toothbrush. I'm going to give you a beautiful smile. Look at these before and afters. And then not modify the behavior. Put in a brand new all on four. They still don't own a toothbrush. Yeah. You didn't manage their expectations. I, you have to tell them, listen, if you continue to do what you've always done, you are gonna, you are gonna kill my work, and I'm gonna look terrible. You're gonna be really mad at me, but it's gonna be actually your fault. 
In order to have this type of work, you have to go to the dentist. If you're fearful and you don't want to ever brush your teeth, you can't have traditional dentistry. Right. You may have to have a removable. Yeah. And by the way, that means it has to come out. You can't just leave your locator denture snapped in for six months because you will fail my work. So these yeah. are the conversations that I have. And they actually, I think, make people like you more. Yeah. You know, it's not salesy. It's not like, I'm going to fix your TMJ. People come in all the time. I'm, I don't know. TMJ is so multifactorial. I could move your teeth, but you could have ligaments. You could be stressed. You could go through a divorce and start clenching. Yeah. You could get in a car accident. Yeah. Why are we promising patients this shit? We promise patients to fix, fix problems they don't even have. You have a bad bite. I know it's not bothering you, but it's eventually going to cause a problem because bad bites are always going to cause a problem. And I'm going to fix the problem you don't even have for $50,000. How's that sound? Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah the, the under-promising and over-delivering. You know, I found myself almost, almost talking patients out of treatment. And then if they still want to do it, that's the patient for me. Yeah. Me too. That's awesome. Yeah. Because I've had those patients where they're like, I want to do it. Let's do it. Let's do it fast. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, let's talk about it. No, no, no. I just want to do it. And then, you know, if something goes wrong, these are the patients that I stay up at night thinking about. And this is mm -hmm. how dentists get so stressed because we care so much. Yeah. You know, we're so passionate about what we do. There's Christian always says, you don't get two dentists in the room and have them not talk about dentistry. You know, we, we love our profession. We're passionate about it. We want to help people so much. But well, we, Kyle, you, there's, a little, there's a little selection bias here going on too. You're meeting passionate dentists because they're showing up at your course. Sure. There's a large percentage you will never meet. They yeah. will never, there's a large percentage. The last CE they did was the day they left school. A very, very, very large percentage. Yeah. And they're just kind of machining it out. Right. Yeah. Well, I want to be respectful of your time, Kyle. This is, we've, you've given us a lot. I know you've got a son that's probably waking up and you're, you're off to work or whatever you got to do. So um, that was awesome, man. I hope that people found that valuable because um, that's massive value. And learning about the unhappiness in dentistry, if, if the one thing we can do, or the one takeaway is we could help one person that's feeling desperate yeah. just to let them know that they're not alone that the fact that you care makes you great. And, and, but don't be crushed by it because we all, even the greatest, um, the greatest uh, professors and, and dentists out there are still, we're still learning and we're growing. And, uh, but, but don't promise so much to your patients, they'll like you more. Yeah, no, it's true. I think that if we can put less pressure on ourselves, we can be more open with our patients. It creates less stress for ourselves and our patients will respect you more because they know you're being honest, you know, just trying to sell them on something. And like you said, if, if, if talking about stress, talking about depression, talking about anxiety can help any of our colleagues get through something, then, you know, we've done our jobs. Yeah. And I, and I want to make a more specific call. I want to make a more specific call. If, if you are feeling like that, if you feel like there's no one to listen to you and there's no friend out there, Lift, email us on the show notes. We'll keep it very private, but I'll, I, I know Kyle, I can speak for Kyle, Peter, and myself. We'll reach out to you in person, and um, we, don't sure. want anybody, we don't want anybody um, thinking they're suffering alone. Any, yeah. any, any one of the three of us would reach out to you in person. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I was actually lucky that um, after I, I, I posted about one of my stress lectures that I was doing to start the conversation, and there was a dentist that contacted me that is actually going to be starting a forum, an anonymous forum for doctors to talk about stress, anxiety, depression. Perfect. Great. So it's, it's coming in the next few months. But, um, I'm just excited that they asked me to be an ambassador for that because if we can help our colleagues that are going through something, this, this would be you know, the same type of joy that we get as <laughs> when we have a patient smile. I mean, what's better than to help someone feel better about themselves? Yeah. The getting is in the giving. So that's good stuff to wrap on. So um, really appreciate your time, Kyle. You're a freaking rock star. I love you, buddy. And you are uh, awesome, Kyle. Thank you so much for your time, pal. Thank you, bud. Hope to see you guys in person soon. Yes, yeah, sir. right? Yes, sir. All right, All right guys. That's a, that's a wrap. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in to another edition of the Bulletproof Dental Practice Podcast. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, see ya. See you, Kyle.